Well, Brother Man's been here a few times. This is one of the few times or rare times that he's here when I'm here. And uh, it had, uh, he first uh, came back in 2012 when I had my hip surgeries. And uh, he said, I remember you on a little screen on the front row. And I was uh, uh, watching, I think it was almost like a Skype situation back then. Didn't have live stream back then or anything. And uh, he's been... Comes back to Ohio occasionally. Of course, he started Grace Baptist Church. Some of you have been there, and uh, that's a church I think you started, didn't you, up there? And uh, planted that church and pastored for several years, and now for many years in evangelism. I, I saw he got a plaque recently, and I thought it was for 40 years. I looked it up, and so it was 36 years of uh, full time in the ministry. He's been preaching uh, for longer than that. But uh, we go back to the same school uh, where we were trained, and uh, I think I think the probably the heyday of that school, and I was glad I was there when we were there, and uh, appreciate Brother Mann, because he's, he's just the same as he was then, as far as belief, uh, a lot of guys, it's not easy to say, you know, as you get older, I remember it years ago being at pastor schools, and Dr. Howes would have the preacher stand up, and, and how rare it was sometimes to see preachers in their 60s at pastor school, uh, or even in their 50s, it was a lot of the younger once and sadly as I, I found out as I get towards that age um, that uh, a lot of men don't believe what they used to believe and don't stand where they used to stand and I appreciate brother man and the other thing about brother man is that and and I, I know this just because I follow him some on Facebook is he he has a real heart to help young churches uh, churches to get planted and churches that are just just getting started uh, he has a heart to go in there and help the pastor and uh, he'll go out and knock on doors and do soul winning and try to try to help the young church get its legs under it a little bit and get established and uh, there's not uh, there's just not a lot of evangelists that'll do something like that and uh, but he does that and uh, we're we're uh, he's just I just appreciate him and uh, appreciate his friendship through the years and his faithfulness to the Lord. Uh, we're glad he's here tonight to speak to us. And uh, got to bring his wife, too. That was a blessing. And uh, this is rare. Yeah. Have you been here? When's the last time you were here? Oh, was it three years? Okay. Because I wasn't here. That's why. <laughs> okay. So, and I don't remember you coming, but uh, it's because I wasn't here to remember it. But uh at least I wasn't getting old and forgot it, you know. Uh, so it's great to have him here. Looking forward to having him preach. Get your Bibles ready. And uh, Brother Man, you come and you take the rest of the time. Will you please? Thank you for reading everything that I told you to read <laughs> in my introduction there. But, you know, I just figured that the book doesn't change, so neither, neither should we. I mean, it's true 1975 when I started preaching, and it's still true today. So why change? You know, that's just all there is to it. Um, but anyway, what I saw on your door out there, let me see, I, th I think I've got, I saw on your door out there that it said, um, it had a picture of a pistol and said something about you can, you know, you're, you, you're, it, it's, it's okay to have your, to carry your uh, concealed carry license here. And I thought, well, okay, well, what about the gun? Aren't you supposed to have the gun too? <laughs> so I've got my concealed handgun license. I put, yay, I put my, uh, um, my holster in my camper, and we go down the road, and I realized I left my pistol at the house. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, and, and you talk about getting older, you know, a lot of times I'll put my holster on and get ready to go to church and everything at, at home, and I'll put my holster on, I get busy doing other things, and I get in the truck, and we're on the way there, and I get to the church, and I realize I've left my pistol. But I would have my, my clip, you know, and uh, if nothing else, I can throw it at them. <laughs> That's what I figure. But I am, I am well armed tonight. Amen. No, I don't have my pistol. <laughs> but I have a cowboy toothpick. Okay, let me show you my cowboy toothpick. I'm, if, 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 wor if worse comes to worse, 
I can use my cowboy toothpick. <laughs> and it says cowboy toothpick on there, on the blade. And that was made in China, of course, because nothing's made in the United States anymore. Um, uh, but uh, I bought that in, in Cody, Wyoming. And it's a good place to buy a cowboy toothpick if you ever want one. <laughs> but uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for coming. And, and thank you, Pastor, for coming to church tonight. <laughs> I was here two years ago, I, and I had the big camper sitting out back here, wherever that building is, there, out, out back. And uh, he wasn't there, he wasn't here. And uh, on vacation or out preaching somewhere or something, I don't know. And uh, so anyway, it's good to see everybody here tonight. And, and that time that you had that, that little TV screen down here, I was so tempted to just go and turn that thing off. <laughs> but I thought, no, he's the pastor. I better not do that to him. <laughs> oh, anyway, so it's good to see you all. Turn to the book of Lamentations, please, Lamentations. And uh, he told me about what time to be done, and uh, that's about the time that I'll be done. Uh, but we, we bought that camper with the idea that um, we would help new churches that are getting started. I have a son-in-law up in um, Ellensburg, Washington. He started a church up there three years ago. And uh, so that gives us an excuse to go up there and see the grandkids. And, 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 I, and I cover it by saying, oh, we're going up there to help his brand new church. But we're going up there to see the grandkids. And, uh, but no, we've, we've been up there a couple times, going up there again pretty soon. Um, after this trip, we'll load up and uh, we'll go back home after this trip and then we'll load up and then go up towards the Northwest. And, uh, but I also have another son-in-law uh, who started a church in Boise, Idaho, three years ago. And those two guys are brothers. And those brothers married two of my daughters, or two of our daughters. And so, you know, I don't know, I don't, does that make them why does that make them to each other? You know, I keep thinking of the saying, I, I, keep, I keep thinking of the saying, I am my own grandpa. I don't know what that, you know, their brothers and their brother-in-laws and their, I don't know. But anyway, uh, we just came, we were just in Albuquerque, New Mexico about a month or so ago, and uh, there's a new church there started by a man that was the president of our college in Texas. His name is Vernon Lovelady, and I've often told him he needs to get a new name. But anyway, um, but he, he started a church about a year or so ago. We went there last year, and uh, my wife and I, we, we went out uh, two or three times a week, uh, passing out material and walking up and down the streets and trying to, you know, meet people and win people and all that. And he asked us back this year, and I preached a, a week revival uh, there, and uh, we had a high day of 20 there. Um, we, the second high day was 18. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five of those were preachers that I invited. <laughs> so they came in support. And, uh, but anyway, so we were there. Pre I preached a revival there for a week and, uh, and all that. So we're very interested in helping new churches um, or churches that have been in existence for a while that are really struggling. Um, and so we, you know, that, that's, that's kind of what we do. Plus we travel and, and hold meetings. I've preached in, in, of course, churches like this one and, and others and, and um, you know, just do whatever we can do. And uh, I'm older today than I've ever been in my life, and, uh, but, I, but I plan on keeping going as long as we can. And uh, so that's the deal on that, okay? Well, Lamentations, um, if you know anything about your Bible at all, uh, you've been saved for any length of period of time, you know a little bit about what Lamentations is all about. Uh, but we're going to go through some things tonight, we're going to look at some things um, uh, about Jeremiah and Lamentations and something particular that interesting that he said in there. Um, I'm going to be preaching, I think, at, the, um, at our teen convention uh, coming up in a few weeks down in Texas. And uh, I preached there last year. And, and this year, um, I, I have a little bit of a background in, in music. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't read music, um, but I've, I've been involved in music uh, much, most of my life. Um, some of that was in, in the wrong kind of music. Um, I was a drummer, 
and I spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, I always in, enjoy watching people play the trombone and the, and the trumpet and, and all that because I had, I had two trumpets and a trombone in, in the last band that I had. We had an eight-piece band. But anyway, and so the, coming up, um, my wife and I, while we were in Albuquerque, we started listening to a series of lectures about music. And I couldn't get past the fourth one um, I, when I heard uh, some of the things that I heard in that fourth one, I, I just, I, at the end of it, I'm sitting there sobbing, uh, just weeping, and she, you know, I was trying to hold it back, because she's sitting right beside me, and I'm trying to hold it back, I couldn't, and she leaned, are you okay? And I said, I'll be all right, you know, so I just had to go out and take a walk, and, uh, but I'm, I'm preaching, um, uh, at our, con at our teen convention, and I'm going to preach two messages that I know of, and uh, they both have to do with, um, with music. Now, I'm not going to be preaching about music tonight, but this message um, kind of sparked some of the ideas that I have, plus some of the information I have. Let, let me give you some a little, little, little tidbit of information here. One of the things that I learned from that, from that lecture, and you may have heard of this before, I don't know how much you've studied all this, but they, they had 72 mice. This, they were, they were going to have, an, have a, an experiment with 72 mice. They divided them up into three equal parts, okay? Now, so that makes, I don't know how many in each one because I went to public school. I can't divide and add and subtract. Anyway, it makes quite a few in each group. But before they, before they divided them in, into three different groups, they... Um, they put them through this maze where the, where the cheese, you know, they had to go th find the cheese through this maze. It took an average of about 10 minutes for them to find the cheese. Are you with me? Okay. Then they divided the mice into three equal groups of 24. I, I knew what it was. I just teased them. But anyway, I, I did the math. And um, they divided, and, and one group, the, the one group didn't listen to any music. The second group listened to class only, they listened only to classical music. The third group listened only to rock and roll music. So after a period of time, and I don't know how long they did it, but for a period of time, there was no music, classical music, rock and roll music. The ones that listened to classical music did not listen to rock and roll at all. It was just, that's all they listened to. Y you got it? Okay, you got the picture? Okay. After a while, they brought the, the mice back in, group at a time. The group that uh, didn't listen to any music improved their time just a little bit. Okay, the average time, just a little bit. The group that listened only to classical music improved their average to about three minutes. From 10 minute average to about three minute average. The group that listened to rock and roll music added 10 minutes to their average. So it ad they, ha they averaged 20 minutes instead of 10 minutes. Then they had to cut the, the experiment short because the mice that were listening to nothing but rock and roll music began killing each other. That's the end of the experiment, because they were dead. <laughs> okay. And so music, and especially wrong kind of music, definitely has an effect on us. And I'm teaching to the young people, uh, and I'll be preaching a lot about the ear gate. Okay. And, uh, but tonight I'm going to talk about one of the, another gate that we have. And so we see this in the book of Lamentations. But Jeremiah, if you go back to Jeremiah chapter number one, we're going to go, we're going to have a quick Bible study through Jeremiah and into Lamentations. And no, we're not going to go into all the chapters and all that. It's just, it's just, it's just basic information here that you're going to get. But we see in Jeremiah chapter number one, Starting at verse number four, it said, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Well, let's stop right there, and we could preach a message against abortion. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. God knows everybody before they're formed in the belly. Are you with me? 
He knows everybody. You know, before the foundation of the world, he knew that we were going to be sinners. He knew everybody, and he knew us pretty well. So that's when he set up, you know, Jesus was going to come, die, for, uh, die on the cross, pay for our sins. Now, so the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And so we see here in verse number 5 that, that God's will for Jeremiah's life he said, I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations, and especially, if you will, to the nation of Israel. But let's pray, and then we'll get into this tonight, and we'll be done about the time you said we'll be done. And so, Father, thank you for the day, and thank you again for this good church, for the pastor, his wife, and these good people. And, uh, Father, for their emphasis on, on missions and missionaries and, and supporting so many and helping so many and and uh, Father, just uh, I know that's one major reason why you're blessing this church, and they're continuing with uh, bus route. They're continuing with soul winning. They got they have the fair. They get people saved, and and that's what it's all about. So I, I just uh, I know you, you're just you're just blessing this church, and so we're thankful for that. And uh, but Father, I, I I just have a short period of time tonight that I'm going to get into this thing. So Father, help me to be concise. Help me to be exact, and help me to say what you want me to say. And thank you for loving us and sending your son to die for us on the cross. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Jeremiah, no doubt he loved his country. Um, he loved the nation of Israel. But if you look at verse number 6, he said, Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And I don't know how many times I've heard preachers say that when I was a kid, I, I didn't want to get up in speech class. I, I know I was an introvert and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I think of that, I think of Moses. He said practically the same thing. He said, Lord, I can't speak. And so he said, okay, there's Aaron, your brother. I'll have him do the talking. And uh, Moses didn't do, do too bad doing the talking after that. Um, but, uh, but he said, I, 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 so I can't speak, I, for I'm a child. But the Lord said unto me, say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, uh, thou, uh, shalt, uh, thou shalt speak. And uh, be not afraid of their faces, <laughs> for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And see, I have set thee this, uh, I, see, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And he gave him some more information there. Now, so Jeremiah, he, he, was, he was ordained as a prophet to the nations. Now, uh, he primarily, I believe, went, net, went primarily to the nation of Israel. But uh, we have the book of Jeremiah. We have the book of Lamentations. And a lot of people, a lot of different nations have heard of Jeremiah and have read Jeremiah and have learned from Jeremiah. So Jeremiah's ministry still goes on to all the nations of the world. And, uh, but there he is, and, you know, it, it's really encouraging, you know, when, when God says, I've ordained thee as a prophet to the nations, and the first thing he says is, don't be afraid of their faces. <laughs> don't worry about how they look at you. I'm giving you my word, and that's what you're supposed to tell people. And, and then he said, I want you to go out, and he said, I want you to root out, I want you to pull down, and to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. And so a lot of what people say preachers do is, is negative. Oh, you're negative all the time. You're negative. You, you know, you're just too negative and, and all this kind of thing. And uh, I had a lady, when I started a church up there at Grace Baptist Church, a lady came a couple times and, and uh, she, said, she told me, she said, well, you're negative all the time. You know, I only came to one or two services and she knows everything about me, of course, and and, uh, you know, my mess, oh, you're, you're just too, ne too negative. And I told her, I said, well, ma'am, you come back tonight, I'll be positive. And uh, so she came back that night, and I said, point number one, I'm positive that I'm against homosexuality. I'm positive that I'm against this, and I'm positive I'm against that, and she never came back. I don't know why. Another lady came back, came to our church. I had 30 chairs set up, okay, just 30 chairs. That's all the room I had. And uh, this one lady, she, you know, she sat on the front or the second row where there was only about three or four rows. And uh, she said, you, you preach too loud. I said, well, sit in the back. <laughs> it wasn't that far back there. And uh, I preached again, and, and she didn't like it, and she didn't come back. Anyway, 
I don't know. But anyway, uh, but, but Jeremiah, he had his call. And, and if you look at verse number 17 here, it says, Thou therefore gird up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto all them, or unto them all that I command thee, be not dismayed of their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar. And so he's to go out and he's to preach the word of God and he's not to, uh, he's not to be concerned about how they look back at him. He's just not to be afraid of their faces because it's God's call, it's God's word, it's God's will. Just go out and do whatever, just go out and do what I tell you to do. Everything will be okay. Well, then, you know, Jeremiah gets out there and he starts preaching, especially to the nation of Israel. He ends up, they end up throwing him in jail. Well, that's encouraging. He didn't do anything wrong. He just preached to them, uh, you know, what God told him to preach, and, and they pick him up and they threw him in prison. And I don't know how many times he was in prison, but one of the times, uh, either before or after, I don't know, um, he, said, he said, that's it, I'm done, I quit. But then he said, I can't quit because there's a fire that's burning in my bones and I've got to keep on going. I don't know if you're like me, Brother Slayball, but there's been plenty of times in the past 40 some years where I've thought about just quitting. Just throw it in the towel. But hey, why, why, why give up such a cushy job to actually go out and work? <laughs> you know, preachers, preachers only work one day a week anyway. You know that, don't you? That's what people say. Well, they all oh, preachers, they don't do anything. They just preach one day a week. Follow us around a little bit and find out how much we work. I guarantee you when I'm not working on this, I'm working on something because there's always something to do. There's always wood to cut. There's always grass to cut at home. There's, you know, we'll be gone for a month at a time and we get back home and the grass needs cut and the, you know, the need to do the trimming again and you, and you need to pull the, pull the weeds out of the, out of the flower beds again and you need to you know, spruce everything up again because in a week and a half you're getting ready to go out for another two months and you go back and you've got to do all that stuff all over again. Because I can't afford to pay anybody to do it while I'm gone. <laughs> so you just do what you've got to do. But here we are, here's Jeremiah. He's doing what God tells him to do, and they throw him in jail. They throw him in prison. They throw him down in the dungeon. They lock the doors. He says, that's it, I quit. But then there's that fire that, that, that keeps burning inside. You know, a lot, of, a lot of guys, they retire when they get in their 60s or whatever, and they say, ah, you know, I'm going to retire, and I'm not going to preach anymore. How can you not preach anymore? I don't understand that. I guess that's why a lot of pastors, they, they stop being a pastor and they say, I'm an evangelist now, you know. <laughs> hey, We've well, got to be called something. And, uh, you know, besides late for supper. But anyway, so, but Jeremiah, he's out doing what he's supposed to do and, and all that kind of thing. Well, anyway, I spent too much time on that. Uh, but then we get into the book of Lamentations. Now, Lamentations, you've got to understand that uh, Jeremiah gets into... Uh, he gets into a lot of trouble, but he also sees the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel scattered all over the face of the earth. He sees it happen. Everybody in here, I think, loves your country. I love the United States of America. I love the country that I live in. I've been in a few others. I wouldn't want to live in those few others. You know, I've been to India, too. I went up to the no very northern part up there where that little, that little pocket area is, and there's constant army uh, trucks running in and out because the Chinese want that area. And uh, then there's that real skinny little area, and there's a lot of army there, and that's the area that I was in uh, for part of the time. But I was clear over on the eastern part uh, next to Burma or Myanmar and, uh, and all that, <clears throat> preaching the Bible conference and everything. I got to ride on one of those infamous uh, um, um, trains of India, Never mind. Uh, I'm glad I live in the United States of America. And I love our country, and I want, and I want, it, to see it, I want it to see it going. Paul had that kind of feeling, too, in Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter number 10, uh, where he said he wished he could be a curse for his brother and for his... Uh, so, so he, said, he said, I would be willing, if possible, to die and go to hell so that my brother could get saved. That's how much he loved his country, I believe. And we ought to love our country also. Nehemiah, uh, he got to, he got to he, there he was in the palace Shushan, which I call Shushine. 
And, uh, but he was in the palace of Shushan, and he, he, one of his friends came by, and, and he said, Hey, what's it like back in Jerusalem? And Hanani told him what it was like back in Jerusalem. And after he heard how bad it was back in Jerusalem, Nehemiah wept certain days, and he wanted to go back, and he wanted to rebuild the walls, and he wanted to rebuild the gates. And Why? Because he loved his country. Well, here we are in America. We have it is it's 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 all around us. They're calling their evil is good and good is evil. Sin is wide open. Murder is a daily occurrence. Immorality is pushed in, in all the media, and God is being pushed out of everything. And false religions are protected, and Christianity is under attack. And that's in America. You can't go anywhere anymore without seeing, excuse me for putting it this way, weird people. Weird, I mean, weird, weird. I saw one young, a young lady one day. Now, wait a minute. No, it was a young man. No, it was a young lady. No, it was a young man. No, it was a young lady. Half of her was a young man, half of her was a young lady. She was really confused. She had a man's haircut on this side and a lady's haircut on this side. Anyway, I won't go any further. It just, it was weird. But anyway, but that's where we are in the United States. Social media is getting really bad. I mean, it's getting to the point with me where it's just, hmm. Don't want to have much to do with it anymore. I, I read news on it, but that's about it. I might copy something and paste it and share it. <laughs> but I, I'm not that big of a fan of it anymore. Um, is a, it's, it is a way to keep in touch with people that want to keep in touch with me. I understand that. But the United States, is it even in existence when Jesus comes back? We all know from the scriptures that eventually we're going to go to a one world system. We know that from scriptures. So is the United States even going to be in existence? We've got people alive today that want to have open borders. Well, that messes with the sovereignty of the country. I'm not against people coming to the United States. I'm not against going to another country but it ought to be done legally in whatever country we're talking about. Are you, are you with me on that? It ought to be done legally. It ought to be done the right way, like our forefathers did, most of them. <laughs> I know some of them came illegally, I think, but that's another story. But here in Lamentations, Lamentations means to be weeping. Lamentations means to be crying. Lamentations means to have a broken heart. And there were some things in Lamentations, and th there's some scary stuff in Lamentations. Look at chapter 3, verse number 12. After talking about Jerusalem and, 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 and the uh, condition of Jerusalem, and Jer Jeremiah laments over Jerusalem's misery, then in chapter number 3, he starts out, verse number 1, I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. So Jeremiah starts talking here personally now about how he feels about things that are going on. Not just about how Jerusalem has been destroyed. Not just about how the nation of Israel had been, had been scattered. But now he's talking about how he feels personally. Look at verse number 13, or verse number 12. It says, He hath bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. You know what that means? Jeremiah, I'm aiming straight at you, buddy. You can lean one way or the other. You can duck, you can hide, whatever, but God's bow, his arrow is pointing right at your stinking heart. That's a scary thought. So Jeremiah, in all of this, he's lamenting about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's lamenting about the destruction and scattering of his people. And he starts talking about how he, how he now is starting to feel personally and how he feels that God has, has now, if you will, kind of pointed his arrow at him and said, Buddy, you're next. 
He put him in prison all those times, and he felt like quitting all those times, but he kept on going, and, and, and people mocked him, and people reviled him, and people rejected him, and people didn't want to have anything to do with him, and people would not listen to him. In Psalm 101, verse number 3, it says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. The interesting verse here in chapter 3 that I want you to look at, I'm going to start reading, I think I marked it down in verse number 40. I want to read it, verse 40. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain. Thou hast not pitied. Talking about God. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that our prayer should not pass through. Thou hast made us as the offscouring and the refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and snare is come upon us. Desolation and destruction. You get the picture here. It's, it's, it's horrible. What he, what he sees and what he's been involved in is not going well. And he says, God has put a cloud in front of him so he won't even hear our prayers. It's not a good situation that they were having here. Verse number 48, mine eyes running down with rivers of water. What's he talking about? He's crying. He's weeping. Why? For the destruction of the daughter of my people. He loved his people. He loved his country. Verse 49, Mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission. He was weeping and lamenting and weeping and lamenting and crying and crying. Oh, and it's almost like Jesus when he stood over and looked at Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have picked you up like, like a hen does her chicks, but you would not, you wouldn't come to him. Verse 49, mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth, ceaseth not without any intermission till the Lord looked down and behold from heaven. And here's the verse, part of the verse. Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. Mine eye affecteth mine heart. If you were to see our country being overrun by an enemy and where you lived was destroyed, and the people that you knew for a lifetime were scattered somewhere over, the, over in another part of the world, never to see them again, I think you would be lamenting. I think you would be crying. And I think if you saw somebody like Nehemiah did from, from the hometown, how is it back home? And they told you that the city's been destroyed and the church that you used to worship in has been destroyed. It would affect you. Why? In this case, the things that Jeremiah saw affected his heart. There are basically four gates that go into our city, and I use this in the message I'm going to preach to the teenagers. I talk about walls and gates in the Bible. And then I switch gears a little bit and I say, now our body, if you will, is a city. The skin, the bones, the muscle, the sinew and everything are the walls. And there are four gates into our city. You have the mouth gate, you have the nose gate, you have the ear gate, and you have the eye gate. Anything that goes in any one of those gates that is not good for us, will affect the body. It will affect the body. And if Satan can get us to put things in our mouth that's wrong to put in our mouth, or, or put something up in our nose, or smell things with our nose, or to, or to listen to things that ought not to be listened to, or to see things that ought not to be seen, it will affect your body. And it never affects your body in a positive way. It always affects your life in a negative way. You look at pornography, it is not going to affect you in a good way. It's going to affect you in a negative way. 
If you put things in your mouth that you should not put in your mouth and you put it in your body, it's not going to help the body. It's going to hurt the body. If you listen to things that you should not listen to, it is going to affect the body. I could have the pianist come up here. I'm not going to do it because I didn't talk to her beforehand, but I could have the pianist come up here and if she could, uh, and play, and play a classical piece with no words to it, and it would affect how you feel. Because music affects you. That's why they said, you know, King Saul, he gets in these fits every now and then. He has these bad days every now and then. He has this bad attitude every now and then. And what we need to do is find somebody who is skillful in instruments. And, and whenever he's like that, we need to bring that musician in. And he needs to play that music. And, it, and, and, so, they, and, and so they found a rock and roll star. And they said, oh, well, we want you to p play your wild kind of music. I mean, we need him to calm down because he's, he's elevated and, and, his, and he's antagonistic and he's hateful and his, he's just in a bad mood and, and nothing goes right around him. And, and we want you to play, I guarantee. To you. If, he, if it was a rock and roller that came in and played for the king, it would not help. It would only cause more problems in the king's life. Because what goes in here affects the body. Now they put the rock and roll music together with some words about Jesus and thinks it's okay. But what agreement has Belial with God Almighty? None. None. So this contemporary Christian music, it is not good for the body because it's the wrong kind of music. Are you listening to me? How do I know that? Because I spent 10 years of my life in rock and roll music. And it did not end up well for any of us. And you put that kind of music together with a little bit of Jesus' words, it's not going to end up well. It is not. A pastor in Albuquerque, New Mexico, he said this. He said, he said before I had contemporary Christian music in my church, he said, everything is fine. But when I let contemporary Christian music in my church, he said, I have more problems with adultery between the members of the church than I ever had before. Why? Because it was like a concert kind of thing. And the people would rush up front just like we did in the concerts. And they're, and they're jumping up and down like this. And there's contact between this guy's wife and this, guy's, this, and this lady's husband. Are you listening to me? And adultery was, was a result of it. You cannot, you cannot, there's no such thing as Christian pornography. Oh, well, I didn't mean to get into all this, but it's not in my notes. <laughs> and I've got just a few minutes left. If there's no such thing as Christian pornography, then what makes us think there's such thing as Christian rock and roll? Rock and roll started with voodoo. John Lennon said, I've sold my soul to the devil. Brian Wilson of B the Beach Boys said, we are, we, are trying to, we are trying to produce witchcraft music. This is back when the music was supposedly mild. You think it's any worse now than it was then? This guy, I, don't, I can't even think of his name. He was a part of the heavy metal group called Death which is a great name for a band. And he, he, said, he said, look, he, they asked him, they said, what do you think of this contem contemporary Christian music? He said, look, he said, if you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian all the way. If you're going to play heavy metal, then play heavy metal all the way. And this is what he said, a lost man. He said, he said rock and roll music and heavy metal music have no place in Christian music. Are you listening to me? Why? Because what we hear affects us. Are you, are you listening to me? Thank God for the old hymns. It never causes me to want to, to want to, I saw them in India. 
they were they had it was the it was the Buddhist I think it was they had their little god out in the street they were having a service going on out in the street and they had music going on and the guys were were doing this thing where they jump and bounce into each other slamming their bodies against each other like they do here the music was not Ravi Shankar with a sitar it was rap music for the Buddhists why it's demonic and it doesn't matter I saw it with my own eyes I was there okay but Jeremiah I gotta get back to Jeremiah Jer <laughs> now back to the message <laughs> stay tuned we'll be back but Jeremiah after seeing all this he said mine eye affecteth mine heart so again Psalm 101 verse verse number uh, verse number three said I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes why It's because if I see something that is wrong to see it's going to affect me what David saw affected him and it caused him to commit adultery and then murder what Lot saw affected him and 2nd Peter 2 8 says for that righteous man dwelleth among them in seeing and hearing vexed or troubled his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He saw it and he heard it and it didn't help him a bit. It vexed his righteous soul. It says later on that it, 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 it vexed him with the filthy conversation of the wicked. He saw it and he heard it and it affected him to the point that when those men came and knocked on his door and said give us your daughters he was willing to give, the, or give us those men he was willing instead to give them the, his daughters and he called them brethren. Why? Because what he saw and what he heard affected him, and not in a positive way. I've never seen anybody, and I've said this, I've said this, and I've, I've got myself in trouble for it, but it's true. I've never seen anybody who turns from the King James Bible to ever have a more holy life. It always goes downhill. Why? Because what you start seeing in the ESV or the RSV or the NIV or the ABCDEFG does not produce a more holy life. It has always produced a less holy life. I know guys that have worked in, in, in as, bus, as, as bus directors and, and, and all this kind of thing, and, and they get out, and they get away from the King James Bible, and they start using the ESV, and then they start dressing and acting like the world. The standards for the wife goes down. The standards for the kids goes down. And, and, and the standards for the music goes down. It has never gone up, Brother Slave. It has never gone up. It's always gone down. Why? Because what you see affects what you do. I forgot I was supposed to preach on the love of God tonight. Boy, I tell you what. So what should we do? How can we guard our eye gates? Because if, if, if what I see affects me, it affects my heart. That's what it says verse, in, that, in that verse. Um, yeah, verse 51. Mine eye affecteth my what? Heart. If what I see, brother, affects my heart, then think about this. The Bible also says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we've got to be careful then what we allow in our eye gates, because that's what we're talking about specifically tonight. Of course, I've talked about the ear gates, but we've got to be careful what we allow to get in our city because the devil is nothing but a roaring lion seeking whom he may what? Devour. The devil is not your friend. He does not like you. He does not want you to live. He does not want you to have a good testimony as a Christian. He does not want you to go to church. He does not want your family to stay together. He does not want you to, uh, to read uh, the Bible. He does not want you to do all that. He, he hates you. He doesn't want, he, he, if he can destroy you, he will destroy you. But the only way he can destroy us is, is if we let him in the gates of our city. Are you listening? What should we do? Well, I think it's pretty simple. 
I think it's pretty simple. Turn to Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4, and we're done. And it's only five after, so I'm doing well. I'm amazed at myself. <laughs> Philippians chapter number 4. Philippians chapter number 4, there are some guidelines I think we need to look at. In verse number, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are what? True. true. How do you know which news is true? How do you know? How do you know which news is true? It's hard to discern anymore, isn't it? Because you've got the fake news media. <laughs> okay. And all that, I mean, you know, according to some people, there's no true news. But anyway. But finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, what's that next word? Think. How does it get in your mind? If we're supposed to think on those things, how, ask, answer the question, how does it get in your mind in order for you to think about it? It goes through the gates. Exactly right. It goes through the gates. You've got to be careful what you read. You've got to be careful what you listen to. You've always got to be on guard. You've got to watch those gates because if you don't watch those gates, that Trojan horse will come along. The Trojan horse, don't know if you know the history of that, you've heard of it, I'm sure, but the Trojan horse, the, the Greeks tried to fight and, and destroy and capture the city of Troy for 10 years. Can you imagine being besieged by enemies for 10 years outside your walls? But, the, but they couldn't get in those gates. So finally they devised a plan. They said, we'll make them a present. The present's going to look like a big horse on wheels. I mean, it's one of the first Tonka toys, you know. <laughs> Just roll it in the city. They made that thing, and it's at, under nighttime or whatever, a bunch of, a bunch of really good soldiers climbed into that horse. The Greeks then got in their ships, and, and the people in Troy saw them sail away. They saw the horse... And they said, wow, they left us a present. They opened the gates, they pulled in the Trojan horse, and they shut the gates. Under cover of darkness, the Greeks turned their ships around, came back, landed on shore. The guys inside the horse then came out of the horse, opened the gates at night, and Troy was done. Didn't take a whole army to do it. It just took that one gate opening up, just temporarily, bringing that little horse in there. If we're going to think on those things, then we have to be careful what we look at and what we listen to. And the guideline is very clear. If it's true, if it's honest, if it's of good report, you get all, through, all the way through that, and then it says, think on these things. I haven't looked it up, and I'll be done with this. I haven't looked it up. I should have looked it up going, going to when I get done. The word think, <coughs> this is my guess, comes from the same word that we use to, to the, the, uh, in the Old Testament. It says uh, to muse. To, uh, M-U-S-E means to think on. Muse. Ick. Wrong kind of music. You think on it, 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 and think on it, because you're allowing it in, 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 as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Is it any wonder those mice started killing each other? 
because how much of rock and roll music has to do with death and killing? Especially some of the music nowadays where they say, kill the cops, kill your parents, kill yourself. One of the people that has to, that has to do with a lot of satanic stuff, his name is Marilyn Manson. He, has, he is an ordained Satanist. And as he will preach, he will mutilate himself. And it's all based on the wrong kind of music. Listen to me. And he allows that stuff in, and that's what he does. So here's your warning tonight, I guess. Hey, I want to live a, a God-honoring, Christ-honoring life. Amen? And I know you do too. And I know this has been kind of a somber message tonight. And whoa, <laughs> okay. Not what you probably expected, you know. But I'm, I'm on a campaign with this thing. Because I was involved in the wrong stuff for over 10 years. When I heard what is truly behind rock and roll music, I wept. It, it shook me to my foundation. I said, I've got to warn people about this stuff got to teach these people about these things because it's dangerous. He didn't give us a spirit of fear but of love and, and of a sound mind. And the way to have that sound mind is to think on these things. Think on these things. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us. And I pray we'll take Philippians 4, 8, forget about everything else, <laughs> and take Philippians 4, 8 and just put it into practice every single day in our lives so we can think on those things that are good so our heart then will be affected in a good way and we will have the kind of life that will be God-honoring and Christ-honoring. So, Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us the word. And, Father, I pray that you help us now just to just, I, I want to please you, and I want you to be happy with all of us. And so I pray we'll take this to heart. And I do pray especially for the young people. Father, they, there might be some in here that on their iPhones, their, their tablets, they have some music. And they've heard tonight, Holy Spirit, if that's true, or, or some of the older, older folks. They might be listening to what we considered some of the older songs. It's really not too bad, we thought, but Lord, even when the Beatles sang, I want to hold your hand, that goes against bib biblical principles right there. For if It's good for a man not to touch a woman. So I pray, Father, that we will we'll reevaluate what we're doing, reevaluate what we're, what we're looking at, what we're listening to, what we're talking about, what we're putting in our gates. Father, so we can live to serve you for a good long time. And Father, when we sin, when we do wrong, when we sin, I pray we'll have the sense to confess it, ask you to forgive us. And Father, thank you again for loving us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Preach you. If you would, please, give me the mic, Dean. Go ahead and stand to your feet, and let's bow our heads for just a moment. I think we ought to have a brief invitation tonight. <clears throat> My question is, are you guarding your gates? So easy to let the guard down and uh, allow things in that don't need to come in. That do not draw us closer to Christ, but actually push us further away. That don't give us more desire to live for God, it pushes us further away. I wonder if how many folks tonight would just say, Preacher, God spoke to my heart tonight. There's some things that he touched on that, that God touched my heart when he brought them up tonight. And uh, Pastor, pray for me this evening. God dealt with my heart tonight. Would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me tonight, Pastor? Yes. Amen. That's good. Hands all across the building. Thank you. You may put them down. I'm going to pray, and let's take just a few moments. We'll just have Nancy play a hymn of invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening and uh, just take a couple minutes and bow the knee to him before you walk out tonight. If the Lord has spoken to your heart, then you need to respond to him. Father, thank you for the message this evening and thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Lord, I'm praying that you'll help us to understand the gates that allow Satan access to 
the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is our body. And Lord, we're to glorify you in our body and in our spirit. And therefore, we have to guard our eyes and our ears. Things that would allow Satan have a foothold in our life. Make us less effective and ineffective for you. So, Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts, and I pray that you'll help us to respond to what you've told us to do tonight, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed as Nancy plays, if the Lord has spoken to your heart, take a moment, use the altar tonight, would you please? That's right. That's right. Look this way just a minute. <clears throat> I don't know if you've, I heard, I think it was this morning, the father of the boy who shot in the recent school shooting down in Santa Fe, a high school in uh, Texas. The dad talking about his son, trying to, trying to, th trying to tell everybody his son is a victim of bullying and that He'd never do anything like this. He said, that wasn't my son who did that. Something happened to him. Something changed him. That's not him. And nobody, <laughs> I'm not talking about the bullying. I'm talking about I wonder what he let in to his gate. I wonder what he was listening to. We, we don't want to go to the music. We don't want to go to the drugs they're on. How many of these shooters have been on drugs since grade school? And that, that changes them and opens them up to demonic activity that uh, nobody wants to talk about. Uh, be careful. Be careful. Uh, let's glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. Amen. All right. Brother man, thank you. Uh, I'd like you and your wife to go to the back, if you would, so as folks go, they can shake your hand, and thank you for coming, and uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for the preaching. And he left the microphone. How about that? Good. <laughs> the, we had somebody Saturday come to the fair, and I, he does, uh, Brother Hamby, <clears throat> Eddie Hamby, he does, you know, uh, he's a ventriloquist, does chalk drawings, does balloons, does all this stuff, and he was using this out there. And we were looking for it after the fair, and he took it home with him. <laughs> so we're glad you didn't take it home with you, and uh, that's great. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us and for your love for us. And, Lord, we are glad we came tonight. You spoke to our hearts. And, Lord, I'm thankful for Jeremiah and what uh, was brought out to us from his life and from what he saw. Remind us that our eye affects our heart and we have to guard our heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life and so lord help us to leave this place with a desire to please you in all we do make us mindful of your presence with us as we go our separate ways now in jesus name we ask it amen all right let's sing every day with jesus is sweeter than the day before 
<clears throat> Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm looking for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. God bless you. You're dismissed. Choir practicing. Choir's practicing. Come on up, choir members. <clears throat>